I'm going to speak a little bit about some of my master's work, um, switch gears, switching gears here and talking about juveniles and recruitment. We just had a question about that. So um, I'm going to be looking at some of the different sampling approaches I tested for evaluating juvenile abundance and how we can relate this to growth and survival estimates. And I have two pictures up here. The first on the left is of us releasing juvenile alewives in Upper Mystic Lake after we caught them using a persane. I'll go into this a little bit more in depth soon. And this picture on the right, I like this one. This is from um, Patanapo Pond, just across the border north in Brookline, New Hampshire. And this is, this is rare. This is a giant school of juveniles, um, broad daylight, right at a swimming beach, at a boat ramp. What you can't see is that just off to the left is the outlet structure to this lake. And um, there's no spillover. The, the, the lake level is really low. So presumably, these fish were trying to emigrate and couldn't at the time. So I like that picture. So I want to start by just acknowledging that UMass Amherst, you know, although we're 100 miles inland from the coast, we're, we're heavily involved in coastal and marine research. Um, fish, birds, horseshoe crabs, coastal habitats. Um, we have a growing marine science program. And um, this is only going to be bolstered by uh, a collaboration now with a shared research space at the um, marine station uh, up in Gloucester. So we're going to share this space with DMF and have a nice lab right on the coast to work with. And so, as far as river herring is concerned, I'm just, I'm just the small piece of the pie at UMass Amherst. Uh, this is a, a collection of folks currently working on river herring, um, some PIs and faculty, Dr. Allison Roy, I think she gave a talk here two years back. I'm co-advised with her and Adrian Jordan. Um, Dr. Michelle Staudinger is a, a faculty and also part of the Northeast Climate Science Center. And Dr. Andrew Whiteley, although he's moved on to greener pastures at the U University of Montana, he's still heavily involved in a lot of our work. So I just want to kind of paint the picture um, and set up the story where my research fits in. But um, Julianne Rossette, for example, a previous master's student now with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, she did a really neat study with her master's and found this large delay between the time adults arrive in these lakes and when they spawn. So we're finding out that adults are present in freshwater lakes longer than we had originally thought. Meghna Marjati, she's also a PhD student at UMass. She did some really nice genetic analysis that showed um, alewives are spawning multiple times and with multiple mates or individuals. And it's the females and the larger fish that arrive first during the migration that are most successful at spawning. Stephen Bittner is a really high achieving undergrad who looked at some size uh, selective feeding behavior and he observed this dietary overlap between juveniles and adults. Um, Leon Gao is also a PhD student. She's working on juvenile physiology, trying to understand temperature and food limitations and growth. Stephen Maddox is now a fish biologist at Mass Wildlife out in Westboro. Um, and he did this really neat predator-prey study where he, he showed that lakes with alewives in them have a uh, higher condition, uh, or have sport fish with better condition, faster growth rates than lakes that don't have alewives. Um, and I think all this work can inform um, tools like something that Amanda Davis, who's, who's here in the crowd today, has and her colleagues have put together this Massachusetts Wildlife uh, Climate Action Tool that looks at species vulnerability and adaptations moving forward with climate change. And so you can see the interconnectedness in all of this research, and I think. It's a really good example of the scientific process and how we're asking questions, we're answering them, but we're opening up doors to dozens more questions as we move, as we move along. And so a lot of this work has revolved around what we know about life history and some of the ecological interactions. But there's lots of data gaps that still remain, right, with this species. A few of these include, um, and this has come up today, uh, nice long data sets of juvenile abundance indices. This is something that we haven't quite developed yet. Identifying sources of mortality, defining suitable habitat, and developing standardized monitoring pro protocols that can start to answer a lot of these questions. And so these data gaps really revolve around the freshwater life cycle of these fish. And so today I'm just going to focus in on a little bit of the standardized monitoring data gap and how my, my research at UMass ties into that. So why count juveniles? We talked a lot about counting adults. Why do we care about the abundance of juveniles? Well, for one, it can complement a lot of these approaches that we've heard about today. So Ben did a nice job at addressing a lot of these challenges with adult migration counts. Counts of juveniles can, can uh, complement this. Understanding this link between 
the number of adults that enter these lakes and the recruitment or the number of offspring produced is really important that can help inform population models. We can determine the impact of freshwater mortality. We can, of course, estimate growth and survival. And we can start to get at whether it's production in fresh water or mortality at sea that's really driving the population growth. Before we go any further, I think we need a little pep talk from our, our friend Samuel L. Jackson here. I think many of you guys are familiar with this commercial where he's asking what's in your wallet, right? And I think this sets up a nice analogy, at least for me, where I think that these river herring populations are much like our bank accounts, right? Where the first question when you up, open up your wallet is how much money do you have, right? One of the most basic questions to manage your budget. And I think on the ecological side, the, the simple question that we need to ask is how many fish are there? It's one of the most basic ecological questions that we can ask is, is what is the abundance of fish? And so we're gonna change the commercial to what's in your lake and I'll, I'll be the face of that commercial. So like I said, we're missing answers to one of the most fundamental questions. So how many fish are there initially? We know river herring are born in freshwater. They're present in high densities. They migrate out to the estuaries where they grow in size but start to experience mortality. They spend several years at sea mixing with other stocks of fish like Atlantic herring. And they experience mortality at every step of the way each of these life stages, right? And it's only here at age four when they're returning to spawn when we're monitoring and counting these individuals, as we've heard again through citizen science counters, electronic counters, acoustics. And so what we're missing are these initial estimates of recruitment or how many fish are born into the population, which without make it really difficult to estimate the impact that mortality has on each one of these life stages. So I'm making the argument today that we really should be counting as well juveniles in fresh water to complement these approaches that we have going on with adults. But how do we do this, right? So fish. Fish are really cryptic organisms. They're underwater, they're hard to see, they're constantly moving around. So how do we detect them when they're actually present? How do we do this with accuracy and precision? We wanna be um, accurate and precise and certain about our estimates. Of course, we don't wanna impact the population given their status. We wanna do this in cost-effective manners that can be repeated and then standardized. Really important for um, data sharing and collaboration across the region. So today I'm gonna speak to three questions. The first is, so what sampling gear is gonna be most effective for monitoring freshwater abundance? And when I say effective, I mean the highest catch rates, limiting mortality, targeting river herring, catching our target species, and then limiting costs. When do we sample? What time of day, what time of year is the most appropriate time to sample these fish? And then how much effort do we need to put in? Because we have limited resources, right? So how much effort do we need to drive these precise estimates? So I chose 16 coastal lakes from Greenwich, Connecticut up to Old Town, Maine. Six of these were stocked, and the other 10 had known estimates of adults through these uh, means that we've talked about, uh, citizen scientists or electronic counters. These sites came in a wide range of physical and chemical habitats. And just to, to focus in on our region, the five study lakes working from north to south that we included in this study were Pentucket Pond up in Georgetown, Upper Mystic, which we've heard about today in the Arlington, Medford area, Whitman's, Whitman's Pond, Glen Charlie, not too far from here, and Snippetuit in Rochester. And so I tested four different sampling methods, and I'm gonna walk through each one, talk a little bit about their pros and cons. The first is gill nets. Okay, so for those of you who aren't familiar, gill nets are these long nets that come in multi-panels, multi each panel with a different mesh size. You stretch them out across sections of the lake and let fish swim into them. They're, really, they're called what's called a passive fishing gear. And so we set these out at three lakes throughout the course of the summer. And what we found is that, you know, like all fishing gears, gill nets are incredibly size selective. So this, this length frequency histogram I'm showing in the bottom, you can see that gill nets are the lighter colored bars. We only captured juveniles larger than 100 millimeters, or about four, four and a half inches. The other bars are from Persanes, which I'll, I'll get into in a minute. They're also incredibly destructive, right? These are the, this is a lethal fishing gear, not what we're looking for when we're trying to um, uh, do limited damage to the population. Okay, we use beach chains as another tool. We use these at all 16 lakes in July. Um, this gear type is, is really limited to littoral or shoreline habitats. And we only caught, we caught very few river herring. We caught about 11% of the total catch was made up of river herring when we pulled that across all of our sites. 
And then acoustic sonar. We've heard, we've heard a little bit about the Didson. So um, I got my hands on one of these expensive equipments from the University of Maine. Uh, like Ben said, 70, 80, $90,000. We ran transects in the lake. You can see this top, lake, top left picture. It's attached to a, a mount that we built. And Ben alluded to the processing time. Um, and really, we weren't able to detect the smallest individuals, right? And this is what we're interested in when we're talking about recruitment. We want to track the individuals from, from their smallest size. Um, and there's a need to ground truth, and Ben kind of set this up perfectly, but when you're going through this video, it's nearly impossible to tell if you're looking at fish in the top picture here, or an unborn baby in an ultrasound picture in the bottom right picture there, which happens to be my son a few months back. Um, so in all seriousness, I think these gears have their place and um, application, but not for uh, estimating juvenile abundance. So I'm going to be making the argument for persanes, pelagic persanes. This is typically an ocean-going fishing gear used to capture schooling fish, um, open water fish like mackerel, Atlantic herring, and tuna. They've been very effective. And so we had a few custom made for our purposes to use in freshwater lakes. How this gear works, so this, this net was about 100 feet long by 15 feet tall had really fine mesh, 1 16th inch mesh. You see that picture in the top left corner. So now all of a sudden we're able to catch the smallest individuals. It could be set by a crew of three people, two people letting the net out, one person operating the boat in about 10 to 15 minutes, set and retrieved in 10 to 15 minutes. So we did this method a minimum of three times each night at all these lakes and repeated it June, July, and August throughout the summer of 2015. So after the net is set, you flake it in, you pull it in from both ends. It forms this nice purse. It traps the fish pursing at the bottom in this top right uh, picture. You're allowed, you're able to kind of capture and corral the fish in the water overboard on the side of the boat and then do your processing. Collect your samples, count them, um, take your genetic samples and release them back into the water alive. Oftentimes you never even have to take the fish out of the water. So very effective in that sense in terms of limiting stress, limiting mortality. So I'm gonna get into a few of the results here, starting with when should we sample? Okay, so this box plot on the left is showing um, the densities, this is in a log scale, um, pooled across all of our lakes for each month. And what we see is that fish are present in the highest densities, not all that surprising, in June and July, right? And, and, and there's no statistical significant difference between those two months in terms of densities. And what's more interesting now, I'm plotting the, the median catch per unit effort. Okay, so our catch rates are shown in, with the bars here. Um, and we can see that our catch rates are highest in June and highest, highest in July, and then June 2nd. And then a metric of precision. So how repeatable is the data? How repeatable are our catch estimates? This is what's called the coefficient of variation. I'll, I'm gonna be referring to this a couple more times. And this is reflected in the line. So we have the highest catch rates in July and the, lo and the greatest precision, okay? so. How the CV works is the, the lower the CV, the greater levels of precision. So in terms of when to sample during the day or at night, right? we know that fish have different habitats, different movements between day and night. So we tested this. And it turns out that nighttime is actually the right time to fish. Um, and it's really not even close. So we catch more total fish at night orders of magnitude more fish at night compared to the daytime. And what's happening here, presumably, is that these, these herring are making a vertical migration up into the water column to feed on zooplankton, and they become more detectable to our sampling gear. We also observed a greater variability in size classes. So this is what we're after, right? We want a representative sample, and this box plot shows those distribution of the lengths of each fish, or not each fish, but the lengths of all the fish um, grouped compared to day versus night. And then lastly, we observed almost, almost a 60% increase in precision. So again, we want repeatable estimates to be able to inform our estimates of abundance. So that's what we're seeing at night. In terms of how much to sample, so to answer this question, I used uh, statistical computer simulation. So I selected five out of the 16 lakes, and I simulated catch data from our, from our true raw values in the field. I simulated more catch data across a range of sampling efforts. So bear with me here, but we didn't actually perform 30 per seine hauls. We performed up to 15 at the, at the most in these lakes. But I ran a simulation that said, okay, how many fish are we gonna catch? And what's the variability in that catch if we sample 30 times? And so what you're looking for in a figure like this, I should say, again, the, 
coefficient of variation, that measure of precision, is plotted on the y-axis. So what we're looking for in a, a plot like this is when that line begins to flatten out. And when that happens, we're no longer getting any more bang for our buck, right? Additional sampling at this point isn't increasing our estimates of precision, and that's what we want to know. And so what we see is that large lakes, Winnesquam and Dam Rascata, these are lakes up north in Maine and New Hampshire, large impoundments, five, six thousand acres, they have greater variability in the catch per unit effort estimates across the whole range of sampling effort. So these larger lakes are going to always require greater levels of sampling effort. <coughs> And to look at this just a little more closely, I'm plotting the change in the coefficient of variation now, okay? Again, across our range of sampling efforts. And we're using a, a rather conservative 1% threshold of this change. And so what we see is that smaller lakes are going to require about 10 per seine hauls, that method I described earlier. And the larger lakes are going to require about 15 to 20 per seine hauls. Okay, this is certainly going to vary. But what we know is that precision is increasing with sampling effort, but only to a point and that lake size is largely driving this. So we can get more than just counts with the sampling method, right? For example, um, really valuable age and growth information that can help, help us inform mortality rates. Um, and I think as Joel alluded to earlier, in a lot of fishes, growth is directly linked to mortality and, and survival, right? So the larger you are, the better chance you have at evading predation, those bigger mouse that are going to feed on you. You can seek out preferable habitat and, and get those preferable prey items, right? So growth is really important. And we can use otoliths, these tiny little ear stones um, in fish that really, they're, they're a neat structure. They lay down these beautiful rings, just like a tree. So obviously the tree on the left and otolith in the middle. And you can count those rings, get an age estimate, and do all sorts of neat analyses and relate what we're seeing in growth back to what's happening in the environment. So just some preliminary results about what we found relating to growth. So here I'm plotting growth on the y-axis, density on the x-axis. Again, log transformed, so, so bear with me there. But what we're seeing is that the lakes with the highest densities of juveniles, really lots and lots and lots of juveniles, have the slowest growth rates. Okay, and what's presumably happening here is what's called density-dependent growth, where these lakes that are stocked, now colored in red, and these, all, most of these lakes are, throughout the region are mostly stocked at about six fish per acre. These are stocked lakes that have low densities of fish, lower than natural lakes, and um, they're having the fastest growth rates. And this sets up this wildly variable size at age. Um, so I think Tom and I were talking about this earlier, but just an example here, you have Pentucket Pond up north on the right um, with fish averaging in August about 120 millimeters or four or five inches compared to Glen Charlie's pond, um, that where fish are about inch and a half, two inches, sampled at the same time. And so you have these wildly uh, variable size at ages across the region. And this, this second plot just illustrates, um, I have otolith growth plotted against the age of the fish in days. And you can see that disparity between stock ponds, the two lakes on top are Patanapo and Pentucket, these stock ponds, really low densities of fish compared to a site like Upper Mystic, high densities of fish, half a million adults enter, so you can imagine how many offspring they produce. Um, and you see that distinction in their growth rates. I was really interested in temperature. So I put temperature loggers in a few lakes, and they recorded temperature every 15 minutes, and we were able to accumulate that data and relate it back to what we're seeing in the increment width. So how, how, mu how, how much do these fish grow each day, and how is it related to temperature? Because fish are cold-blooded, there has to be some correlation there, so we wanted to look into it. And sure enough, um, there is. So the red line is the, uh, the average daily surface temperature. This is, this is an example. This is Whitman's Pond in Weymouth. We did this for four different ponds, and the trend is really similar. So the red line's temperature, the black line, is the increment width growth in the otolith at the daily scale. And you can see in the first 20 days or so, we have a pretty steady period of growth. And as these lakes start to reach 23, 24, 25 degrees Celsius and really heat up, that growth tap tapers off and oftentimes declines. Um, so there is a strong correlation with, with growth at the daily scale. So quickly, um, we know that persanes are an effective way to go. They limit mortality. They're able to detect these fish, but only up to a certain size, right? If we're interested in larger juveniles, emigrating fish, we might have to move to different methods. Um, if you're going to use a persane, you're going to have to sample at night. I'm sorry about that, um, but it's actually a lot of fun. 
uh, and in, in the early part of the summer, in June and July. And that these larger lakes are going to require a much more sampling effort than smaller lakes. And in terms of growth, we know that density is a strong driver. Um, temperature is well correlated with growth to a point, and a life history strategy for these juveniles may be to grow fast and leave early, right, if they can. I showed that picture early about flows not being over the dam. We've talked a little bit about eutrophication. We do have some results that show that increased um, phosphorus levels and dissolved organic carbons are, have negative effects on fish growth um, and are increasing mortality. So I think it's going to be beneficial to allow these fish to leave when they want to leave and make their way to large rivers and estuaries. Quickly, a couple next steps um, about where I'm going from here, because as I said, I'm, I'm just starting my PhD. I'm interested in the year-to-year -year variability in these estimates that I'm producing, or that we're producing. Um, growth, mortality, production. Uh, you know, it's, it's risky business to make management decisions based on a year or two of data, especially for a species like river herring with such a complex life history, right? So I'm hoping to add a few more bars to this plot here. Um, Presumably, I'll, I'm going to be around forever now that I'm starting my PhD. So I can add a few more bars to this and understand how, we're, how these estimates are varying year to year. I'm interested in large rivers and estuaries, the next phase of this, these fish's life cycle. What's the most effective ways to sample them in estuaries? And how are their growth and survival rates changing in these habitats? And finally, how are river herring responding to dam removal? This is big. This is a big question. Massachusetts, we, as we know, we're, we're leading the charge in dam removal and fish passage. And I want to know how many years it's going to take to recover a population. Um, how is this production in, in a newly restored run compared to natural runs? And so we've talked about a few of these dams. The Cotton Gin Dam has already come out. That leads up to Robbins Pond. We have some really nice baseline data on this site. And we're going to be sampling that site this summer. Same with Lake Sebastia where the Reed and Barton Dam is scheduled to come out in a few weeks or a month or ASAP, hopefully. So um, there's a lot to still, you know, with river herring, there's a lot of information that we've discovered. There's lots to still learn, which makes it a fun species to study. Um, and I'll wrap up by just saying a study like this all the way across New England, I couldn't have done it without friends, colleagues, conservation commission folks, people like yourself all the different state and federal agencies. Um, and I have to just mention the funding, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, the Nature Conservancy, and last but not least, the DMF, who have really been integral to, to our success at UMass since the beginning. Um, so with that, thanks for your time, and I'm happy to take some questions. Yes, go ahead. I think they're light and sensitive. We know that they're light and sensitive. We know that zooplankton make big vertical migrations at night as well, and they make these horizontal um, migrations into the shallows. So I didn't specifically touch on this, but we don't have lights. We don't use, we use a, a red headlamp. There's no lights on the boat. We use not the gas motor to set the net, but a small, quiet electric motor. So we, we've really taken precautions to, to minimize disturbance for these fish. Um, so I think that if you're asking about their catchability, it's because they're, they're up on the top of the water column and dispersed, feeding. What we think is happening during the day, and we don't have evidence of this yet, I'm really interested in this, but we think they're schooling. We think they could be using the anoxic areas on, on the benthic or the bottom habitat. Um, we just don't know. So that, those are one of the questions I'm interested in. What we do know is that they're just more catchable at night um, with this gear type. And so that, that's why the recommendation comes at night.